Ever wonder what is going on behind the scenes as the government investigates criminal cases? Are you interested in the strategies the government employs when bringing prosecutions? I'm your host, Greg Soferin, along with my colleagues in Hush Blackwell's White Collar Internal Investigations and Compliance Team. We will bring to bear over 200 years of experience inside the government to provide you and your business thought-provoking and topical legal analysis as we discuss some of the country's most interesting criminal cases and issues related to compliance and internal investigations. Welcome to the latest edition of the Justice Insiders. I'm your host, Greg Sofer, and I'm lucky enough today to be joined by my colleague from our Washington, D.C. office at Hush Blackwell, Cormac Connor. Cormac, thank you so much for joining us today. Certainly, Greg. Happy to do it. Today, Cormac and I are going to dive into a very interesting case, one of the DOJ prosecutions related to the so-called Varsity Blues scandal. Operation Varsity Blues was a wide-ranging investigation that most folks in our audience might remember due to the intense press coverage. It involved a scheme to get kids into select colleges and entailed fraud, bribery, and conspiracy. The case we're looking at today is one that unraveled for the government in the first circuit, which reversed the conviction of two of the parents involved. Cormac, can you walk us through a little bit about the facts of the case and what the First Circuit did here? Sure. So Varsity Blues, as you said, Greg, has gotten a lot of press. It, it is an investigation that was first unsealed back in March 2019. And, and the reason in part that it got a lot of press is because there were, frankly, several famous people, actresses and, and well-known uh, uh, wealthy individuals in in. Uh, communities across the country who had been involved. Uh, and, and so that itself generated a lot of buzz. But then it, I think it also got into this concept that so many parents across the country are familiar with of like how to get your kid into school and what, you know, are people playing on a level playing field. Um, the, the general nature of the investigation, of course, involved getting these various parents, kids admitted into, into prestigious colleges. Uh, as the investigation was, uh, was made public, there were over 50 people that, that ended up getting implicated. The central figure was a guy named Rick Singer. And what Rick Singer was doing was telling parents of college applicants that, that he could help get them into what he called a side door of a lot of, of schools where he had connections. And the way, the distinction and what he meant on this side door was the way he described it to the parents was the front door was applying the old fashioned way and just submitting your application and, and getting judged uh, on, or weighed on the merits. The back door, as he would describe it, was for the extremely wealthy uh, folks who would make donations and, for, for example, build a or pay for the building of a, of a library or school building. And he described that as sort of the customary back door. The side door that he was setting up was relationships that apparently Singer had developed with uh, administrators and coaches at various different colleges uh, across the country where the coaches or the administrators could help get a kid uh, admitted by presenting them as an athlete. And in the cases that we'll be talking about, uh, the, the parents of these kids uh, had applicants that were probably not qualified, would not have gotten in on their own. But in one case, uh, the, the parent had a, a daughter who had played JV basketball. And, and so Rick Singer's play there was to present that kid as a basketball recruit, even though she had not played basketball for the previous year and only ever played in JV. And, you know, by, by all appearances would, would never have gotten a second look from any of the coaches at this particular school, which I believe was USC, uh, Southern California. And USC was a, seemed to be the, where most of the activity was taking A lot of, yeah, a lot of USC, a lot of USC applications involved in this, in this uh, investigation. Well, well, let's stop here yep. for just one second, yep. Cormac. So, I mean, the conduct that you're describing and that um, is encompassed in this case is pretty offensive. I think there's, it's hard to look at it and say this is this is good. Um, I recall it also. They also uh, arguing that some of these kids had learning disabilities or other, I mean, it was pretty offensive kind of things. It's it, 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 cheating. It's 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 certainly not good behavior. The question is. 
firstly, is it a crime, right? I mean, there's lots of things that go on out there in the world, in business, in private life that are not good. But the, the federal government, before it brings a federal case, has to determine whether this was a crime or not. So what did the government charge here? So what the, the government ended up charging were uh, basically fraud and bribery uh, allegations and, and crimes here. And, and, it's, and part of that was a conspiracy to do both, a conspiracy to commit fraud and a conspiracy to commit uh, to pay bribes to get these kids in. Uh, the, as, as we look ahead at this, this First Circuit decision, uh, the First Circuit really poked holes in the government's theory across the board by by basically saying the government you you kind of overstepped and over in in a way overreached by pushing too hard on the boundaries of what these crimes really conceivably could be and so the when we talk about the fraud the the, the allegations and i believe the government's theory was that uh the parents had committed fraud and these are and to be clear the parents were talking about in these two particular cases uh, last name Abdul Aziz and Wilson, both of whom were parents that were indicted, uh, had worked with Rick Singer to get their respective kids into college. Um, the fraud that the government alleged was, you know, basically creating these applications that were bogus, you know, the, it was supplying statistics for kids in, in their respective sports that they didn't have, providing, you know, photographs of of game situations that sometimes the kids weren't even in things like that so just basically these are phony applications and and uh there's the fraud uh and then because they're commits transmitted via mail and wire that that becomes the hook uh for those those fraud counts the bribery which was itself interesting is and how the government's theory came apart there the bribery was uh, uh, alleging that the payments that these parents made to Rick Singer's foundation, which he, you know, Singer described his, his organization as a foundation that would then forward the parents' payments, often, you know, $500,000, half a million dollars or more, would then distribute those funds to the university. So one of the parents' defenses, and I'm speaking both both cases here, was that they thought the money they were paying was going to the university. And so the question of the bribe came down to, is it really a bribe if the so, supposed victim or the university being the victim actually got the money? And the First Circuit disagreed there, saying that, you know, there's no there's no support for this, uh, for that kind of a case, if it's not the bribe going to the administrator or the bribe going straight to Rick Singer. The bribe was actually going to the university who was arguably the victim in all of this. Uh, so, Well, and there's also a, a, this concept and the courts have been slowly chipping away at this or at least more clearly defining honest services fraud. And maybe in another episode, we'll cover the fraud here and honest services fraud, which the courts have overwhelmingly been pushing um, a concept that there has to be a property interest here. And they focused, this court considered that question and looked at the property interest of slots at a university. And uh, the case is important for that reason as well, but we don't have the time to handle that part of the case today. We're going to really try to focus in, I think, on the conspiracy aspect of the case. And the conspiracy aspect of the case, you've written an article, which we can link to, and by the way, we'll also link to your bio in the show notes, Cormac. But um, let's discuss, let's sort of uh, drill down on the conspiracy aspect of the case. What did the court do there? So the conspiracy charged in the indictment was that Abdulaziz and Wilson, the two parents involved, had conspired broadly with everybody that was implicated. And that includes Singer it includes the school administrators and coaches, but it also included all of the other parents uh, that had been implicated in this investigation. That I believe the total have ended up being 15, 18 different parents and families that that had uh, falsified these applications to get their kids into schools. Uh, that general broad in, uh, conspiracy that was alleged in the indictment 
ended up being the government's undoing in a lot in many ways in this case because the court looked at that and said that you know Abdulaziz and Wilson couldn't be held to account for this broad sweeping uh, conspiracy because they weren't conspiring with each other. For example, they may have been conspiring with Singer, but they weren't conspiring with each other. In fact, the court said they were more likely competing with each other to try and get their kids into school. And so the court looked at what is foreseeable and what is the understanding of the agreement. And the, if we want to talk more about the the basics of conspiracy, that really a conspiracy boils down to what is the agreement? What are people agreeing to do? And the court looked at that and said they, they couldn't find evidence to show that either of these two uh, men who were charged had conspired in such a way that their agreement included a conspiracy that it looped in all of these other parents. So let's try to break this down for our audience, because conspiracy is a, a crime and a, a tool that's used by the federal government. Uh, in my many years of federal service, I charged it many, many times. It goes under the category of what are called inchoate crimes, that is not completed crimes or incomplete crimes. And attempt would be another example of that. You attempt to rob a bank. You conspire to rob a bank is the same thing. And you see it all the time, and it's often charged in addition to the substantive counts, say bank robbery, because the government uh, is able to bring in evidence of your co-conspirators, and your co-conspirators can come in and testify against you, as happened in this case. And it broadens often the ability of the of the government to bring in evidence. And here, the First Circuit, not only did they say that this was not a conspiracy that involved all the other parents, but most importantly, they said, because the government couched it that way, it brought in evidence that prejudiced these two particular defendants, evidence that would not otherwise have been admitted against them, which included, by the way, the testimony of one or more of these other parents. And therefore, they were prejudiced. And that's why the convictions were overturned in, in, in large measure. But I, I just want to break this down a little bit in terms of what is conspiracy. So conspiracy is an agreement, and it's an agreement to commit an object crime. That is one of the other crimes in the big, thick book uh, that federal prosecutors utilize. And um, most conspiracies require also an overt act. So it's not just three people sitting in a room or sending emails to each other or talking on phones, but they also have to do something in furtherance of the conspiracy, which otherwise you're basically punishing people for what they're thinking and what they're talking about. But, they, but in a conspiracy case, like an attempt case, the defendants are always free to argue that they really weren't going to do any of this, that they were never going to commit the crime, they weren't serious, um, or that they withdrew from an agreement. And so the bottom line is it really is an amazingly powerful tool for the government. It allows the government to charge very serious offenses, even when someone hasn't completed their crime, and it allows in all of this other evidence. And people just don't understand, I think, many times when they're charged with a conspiracy that the government was able to pull the trigger on this thing. And depending on how broadly they define the conspiracy, the government takes a big chance if they're wrong about the definition of the conspiracy and the judge allows in all of this other evidence, you can end up with the kind of result that you had here. Those are the basics of a conspiracy case. So Cormac, um, in this particular case, why uh, you started to touch upon this, but why did these two defendants not conspire with the other parents? Well, I think what the court, and when I say the court, I'm talking about the First Circuit, the appeals court, because, you know, to be clear, the defendants presented these same arguments to the trial court uh, and tried to get the case dismissed at the trial court level, and the trial court ruled against them. So uh, there's, you know, your, there's your lesson in, in criminal litigation is to, you know, basically don't give up, uh, keep pushing your case because you may get another, you know, you get another chance at the appeals level. But um as the appellate court looked at what happened at trial, uh, it determined that these parents 
Abdulaziz and Wilson really couldn't have been conspiring with each other. And that that's the important piece here, because the government's charged conspiracy was that they were conspiring with each other. And so that allowed all kinds of evidence and testimony from other parents to come in. And in fact, the government presented testimony from these other parents and then and then in their closing arguments to the jury said, the reason you know that Abdulaziz and Wilson are guilty is because these other parents said that they knew what they were doing was wrong and what they were doing was a crime. And so you should imp implicate uh, Abdulaziz and, and Wilson uh, because they're all part of that same conspiracy. And you should, you should assume and infer that because these other parents knew what they were doing was wrong, that therefore Abdulaziz and Wilson also knew what they were doing was wrong. Uh, the court held that that allowing that testimony from these other parents uh, as part of this broader charged conspiracy ended up being prejudicial to Wilson and Abdulaziz because, as the court found, they're really indifferent to each other. They don't care if, you know, for example, if I'm Mr. Abdulaziz, I don't care if Wilson's kid gets into school or not. And Wilson doesn't care if Abdulaziz's kid gets into school or not. They just want their own kid to get it. And so the, what the appeal, appeals court held was that trying to suggest that these two parents were conspiring somehow with each other for a common goal was going too far. Now, the court didn't suggest, to be clear, that they had not conspired at all. In fact, the court held that there was probably sufficient evidence to prove that they had conspired with Singer and with the other you know, school administrators related to their kid, but it was too much to suggest that they were in part of this broader conspiracy. And that's where the court got into the analogy to a rimless wheel, where if you think of the spokes on a bicycle wheel and you put Rick Singer and his network of college administrators that were implicated in the middle as the hub of that wheel, and you treat each of the parents as spokes on the wheel, it, it is an improper charged conspiracy if you don't then have a rim around those spokes to sort of link up all of these various individual uh, separate conspiracies. And that's where Greg was talking about before the concept of the the what we traditionally think of as in the drug context, where you can have a low level, uh, you know, certain person sitting on a street corner that's that's alerting. The bosses that the police are nearby, for example, that person gets roped into a conspiracy charge and can be implicated in lots of other crimes that that person had nothing to do with because by knowingly joining a criminal conspiracy to distribute narcotics, you, you just have to understand and reasonably foresee that lots of other crimes such as distribution and purchase of drugs, perhaps even violence, uh, may happen. And therefore, you can be on the hook for all that is a, a major distinction, therefore, to jump from that template to what we're dealing with here, where it's pretty clear from the facts that Abdulaziz and Singer were pretty, pretty clearly staying in their respective lanes and not doing anything that would benefit the other uh, with respect to each other's kids. They were just focused on their own. That's an interesting point, And it leads me to consider two questions. First, why did the government opt for the broader conspiracy argument here with all the risks that such a strategy might entail when the more narrow conspiracy charge seems like a winning play with less risk? Could it have to do with the parents' decision to fight rather than to plead out? And then relatedly, what do you think led the trial court to bite on this evidence and serve up convictions that were, of course, ultimately reversed by the appellate court? Yeah, well, it's it's interesting. I guess the first to your first question, uh, the the evidence that was presented really it was interesting, and you know, the, you know, armchair quarterbacking this is always easier. But trying to to discern what the strategies were by the prosecutors because they they put on testimony from their agents that had done the investigation, they put on testimony from other parents that had pled guilty and agreed to cooperate and to testify. They did not put on testimony from Rick Singer, 
Uh, and I'm sure there were reasons for that, but I thought that was really interesting that they had chosen not to put on testimony from the guy, right? The the center of this whole thing um, that instead relied on testimony from all these other parents to implicate the two men that were charged. Um, the How did the district court screw it up? You know, I think it's, it's again, it's, we're, we're looking at this at the benefit of hindsight and with the first circuit's analysis, I could see that, you know, the trial court looking at this, uh, comes down a different way. You know, I think, I think the first circuit got it right, but, you know, ultimately I could see that a judge looking at this would think in the sort of like in the, in how, how do you define the scope of the agreement, the scope of the conspiracy, um, looked at it as being a closer call and aired on the side of proceeding with trial and dismiss or denying the motion uh, that challenged the conspiracy counts. Um, but beyond that, you know, I, I, I'm, I can only say that I'm sure that the district court had its reasons. Um, but I think, you know, ultimately when you look at the way the first circuit broke this out and it's 105 page opinion um, that, that, uh, you know, and then, and then of course they compared it to, an old uh, Supreme Court case, Kodiakos from the 40s, which really does line up factually, I think, better than a lot of the other conspiracy uh, uh, templates that the government was looking at. In that Kodiakos case, the the allegations were that um, people were trying to cheat the um, National Housing Act and and get loans for houses that they didn't otherwise qualify for and it submitted fraudulent applications, but they had all gone through the same broker. And what the Supreme Court found there was similar to what the First Circuit did here, is that each of these loan applicants were out for themselves. They didn't care how the other loan applicants fared. They were trying to get their own loans approved. You know, it's probably worth explaining a little what we mean by hub and spoke conspiracy here. It helps to explain the government's prosecution strategy in this particular case. People sometimes don't understand that in conspiracy law, you don't actually even have to know your co-conspirators or interact with them to be found guilty of conspiracy. And juries are instructed exactly that way. So in light of that uh, and the fact that conspiracy is an inchoate crime, an incomplete crime, the charge is an extremely powerful tool and it's regularly used by the federal government. But the strategy requires that the conspirators' interests are connected or correlated in some way. There are outlines to what is permissible. And the court found here, as you mentioned, that the parents' interests were not connected enough, were not aligned enough, that they were, in fact, indifferent to one another's activities, or even more so, they were outright competing with one another. But here, again, I think the, the critical issue is if the government gets this wrong, even with this expansive view and the, and the legal justification for charging an expansive conspiracy, that the jury comes away having heard evidence that they would not otherwise be able to hear. And that really is the gravamen of the reasons that the court overturned the conviction on the conspiracy grounds. But Cormac, you said something earlier, which I think is important. You said, well, a lot of people have already pleaded guilty in this case, pleaded guilty to the very conspiracy that uh, was inappropriately charged here, according to the court. And they've already been sentenced. And w- what happens to them? They, they're they SOL, as we say, aren't they? Yeah, in, in a nutshell, that, that's what it comes down to. The, you know, the plea deals and plea agreements just sort of by design are intended to shut it all down, right? You, you, you're, you're buying certainty both for the defense and for the prosecution. And so, uh, I, I mean, I've never been in part of a plea deal that didn't involve a waiver of, of right to appeal. And so, you know, that you, you can certainly ask for that, but, you know, I'm sure you never would have, and I never would have when I was a prosecutor, never agreed to it. Um, you know, the whole point again is, is to bring the case to a close. And so all of these other parents in particular who had pled guilty and entered deals with the government, um, may be looking at this development and, and having buyer's remorse, but it's too late. They, they signed up for deals that, that almost certainly involved a waiver of any right to appeal. And so, uh, they, they may wish they had, uh, 
stuck with it and fought the government to, you know, to the end. But ultimately, their plea deals will stay because, you know, it, it, I can't imagine a circumstance where they'd be th- that they would have carved out an ability to appeal it after the fact. I think you're right. And uh, it's certainly true in the, in the federal government that almost every plea deal includes a waiver of appeal, as you point out, to shut this down, to make it a, a final adjudication. And the individuals who go to trial, you said, well, sometimes, you know, don't give up. There's another side to this, though, and this case really highlights this. I mean, it's funny. There's a lot of criticism of the deals that were cut to these people. I, I, I read a lot of articles that said all these rich, entitled folks ended up getting all these sweet deals. They hardly did any jail. They hardly, you know, some of them got other kinds of compens- uh, other kinds of deals where they, they had an accommodation and didn't have to plead guilty to the most serious charges. Hardly anyone did any real serious time. You know, um, they the the cost of going to trial, in addition to the financial and emotional cost, means often that your sentence is more significant. And this is commonly referred to as the trial penalty. I don't really look at it that way. I think that people are given tremendous breaks in the system so that the case will be resolved. You can see why the government, in a case like this, actually did quite well by resolving so many of the of the cases by a plea. And so the defendants here actually got more significant sentences, I think, um, based on uh, what we've read. They It looks like they were looking, they both got more than a year in, in, in prison. And not only that, but they went through the pain and expense of a trial. But as you pointed out, Cormac, if the game's not over in a federal case, federal criminal case, until after appeal. And it looks like these guys made the right choice. But again, this is a difficult, in, in retrospect, that's easy to say, but it's a difficult decision. There's no question about it, isn't it? Totally agree. I mean, the, you know, putting, remembering my my prosecutor hat in that role, I, I agree with you. You know, I, I was always... Uh, by supervisors, et cetera, as I was working my way up the ranks at, at the Justice Department and in the U.S. Attorney's Office, you know, the, the the organizing theory on plea deals was it, it gets worse with time, right? Like you get your most generous deal earliest in the case, but if you make the government do the work to build the case, to go to trial, to get ready, then you shouldn't get uh, a generous deal after having done all that extra work. That was certainly the the rationale on the government side, but the the trial penalty concept that you talk about is is a real one. Now that you know I've been on the defense side for so long, you know that is it, it is the other side of that coin to say, well, if you think you've got a meritorious defense and you think you've got a real shot at beating this, and you or for example, you really think you didn't do it. Uh, and you and you test your your uh, your your theories and your defenses at trial. Should you then also get hammered because you did so, um, and just because, and then you went to trial and lost, uh, even though you had meritorious defenses. So I, you know, I think that's a it's a very real philosophical debate, uh, perhaps political debate on how do we you know how do we structure our criminal justice system to to where you want people to feel like if they have meritorious defenses um, or actual innocence defenses, that they're not going to get punished for taking the, taking those defenses all the way to trial and not taking a, a plea deal. I mean, it's, you know, you know, I'm sure both have plenty of experience representing defendants who are uh, looking at uh, pretty heavy, possible penalties and a plea deal comes across that lets them avoid the worst of that, uh, it becomes a pretty rough dilemma as you think about, okay, I may not win. And if I, and if I do lose, then I could get, you know, whatever this plea deal is times 10 times a hundred, who knows? Uh, so you're, you're really rolling the dice and that becomes a, a, a factor in decision to, to take a plea deal or not, that ends up becoming, frankly, separate from a question of guilt. Uh, so th- those are all you know important issues, and I think the um, you know, as you talked about, what can prosecutors do when they bring a conspiracy charge? You know, you can imagine those plea negotiations uh, would have involved the investigating attorneys and investigating agents pointing out to each of these parents that, oh, by the way. 
we're going to be charging you with this overarching conspiracy. And oh, by the way, we're going to have every other parent testify. And they're all going to be saying that what they thought was wrong. And therefore, what you did was wrong. So are you going to be the one that holds out? Right. And putting that weight on on each of these defendants is a heavy load to bear. And, and obviously, when you look at the numbers, you had 15 defendants uh, get charged, 15 of the parents that got charged. 12 of them pled guilty. One got a presidential pardon. And the only two that took it to trial were Abdulaziz and Wilson. Yeah. And, you know, uh, when it when it's a company, for instance, that's being investigated and has to negotiate with the government. And this is true of individuals also. You also have to think about the sort of public relations and the impact on your customers uh, and your business partners were you to fight the allegations. So when a company goes through these same kinds of agonizing decision-making uh, inflection points, they're thinking not just because you can't put a company in, in prison, but you're thinking about the PR and the impact on your business. And so when the government comes to you and says, we could charge the corporation in one of these kinds of overarching cases, there's there's even a whole other set of factors to be considered. Absolutely. No, you're thinking shareholders and employees and cause right, all of that comes into play and, and uh, becomes a very difficult decision. You know, I've, I've, as we've talked about this and, and you know, how might this this translate to other areas uh you know frankly you think about the same kind of uh basic template of facts and how might a government charge a conspiracy i i uh, my head goes immediately to investigations involving you know federal contractors for example where you know i've been part of several investigations where you know the government has has alleged that uh you know a a, a group of companies are improperly affiliated with each other because they have a certain owner in common or a certain officer in common, or they were connected back to the same prime contractor who may have had relationships with a dozen or more smaller businesses. And, and maybe those other businesses don't know about each other, right? And, and uh, yet, are they all going to be looped into the same conspiracy if there's no proof that each of these individual businesses knew about the larger scheme. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly see that being, you know, this concept and what the First Circuit has identified as being as as being translatable to certain circumstances like that. I agree. But um, again, I think generally speaking, the law puts the federal prosecutors in a very strong position on these things. And it's a it's an incredibly powerful tool. The First Circuit has clipped these particular federal prosecutors' wings. There's no question about it. How far that goes, whether it applies in other circuits, and how it applies to these other complex fact scenarios, only time will tell. But thank you so much, Cormac, for joining us today. It was a fascinating discussion. Again, maybe we'll have you back and talk about the fraud aspect and the honest services concept that we discussed earlier. Happy to do it, Greg. I really appreciate you having me on. Thanks for joining us on The Justice Insiders. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please go to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts to subscribe, rate, and review The Justice Insiders. I'm your host, Greg Sofer, and until next time, be well.